Okay. Thank you all so much for coming and joining us today for the Studying Sustainability Abroad presentation. Um, just a few things to keep in mind before we get started. Um, we just want to let you know that this presentation will be recorded. And if you have any questions as the presentation goes along, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen uh, so we can address them at the end. So my name is Josh Knowlton, and today I'm being joined by my colleagues, Robin Pipkin Parker and Susan Hansen. And we have wonderful IES Abroad alumni with us today, and we'll introduce them to you later on in the presentation. But first, I just wanted to talk about um, a little bit about who IES Abroad is and what we are as an organization. So we are a nonprofit that was founded in 1950. Um, so we have over 70 years of experience sending students abroad all around the world. Um, we have a wide variety of programs in five different continents. Um, so whatever you're studying and um, you know, whatever you're interested in, wherever you're going, we have something that, that is for you. Um, we also have a strong academic foundation of 250 plus, uh, 260 plus schools. And in everything we do, we wanna take a student first approach. Uh, that means prioritizing our students in our programming and offering a generous amount of scholarships and aid to students every semester. And last but not least, um, we know that study abroad changes people. Um, so it's really neat that we, um, that our students have access to a network of over 150,000 alumni to connect with um, when they return. So why would you study sustainability abroad? We took this quote from Baba Diom, who is a prominent Senegalese forestry engineer. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. We think this illustrates the importance of sustainability as a subject, but also as it's a topic that affects everyone on the planet, the relevance of foreign study of sustainability. Studying sustainability abroad allows us to develop global perspective on one of the most pressing issues of this century. It is also a subject that is relevant across disciplines. So whether scientific research, business, fashion design, healthcare, urban planning, or anything beyond. So let's take a look at some of the programs we offer that focus on sustainability abroad. First, we'll go over to Europe for a look at our environmental studies and sustainability program located in Freiburg, Germany. Freiburg is a small city in the southwestern corner of Germany and is also surrounded by the Black Forest. This program offers courses in a variety of disciplines under the umbrella of sustainability. There are courses in ecology, biological sciences, policy, urban studies, and even business. Courses on this program are uniquely offered in a module format, which means you'll get to completely immerse in courses one at a time, and that allows you to really engage in the intensive field studies that are a part of every course. Field studies will get you out and about and quite active, I might add, in the Black Forest and the nearby Alps, as well as the small city of Freiburg using these environments as your learning laboratories. Freiburg itself has consistently been ranked as one of the world's most sustainable cities. Um, it's highly walkable. There's really great public transportation that connects you all over everywhere. Um, carefully integrated and celebrated urban waterways with their own legends. And high rate of use of energy from uh, renewable sources, which is really apparent in just the super clean and fresh air there. And pro tip, plan to study there in the spring semester um, to be able to take advantage of the post-program research assistantship module, which will allow you to extend your stay over the summer months when Freiburg is absolutely beautiful. Next, we'll head over to South America in the Galapagos Islands. And this program is really perfect for students who want to go beyond the classroom and encounter issues relating to climate change um, and sustainable practices firsthand. 
Um, so students spend their first uh, month in the program in Quito, Ecuador, and then spend the rest of their time in the Galapagos Islands. And there are four specific academic tracks, depending on your interest. Uh, so you can study sustainable tourism, marine ecology, people politics and the environment, or evolution, ecology, and conservation. Um, one of the really neat things about this program is the type of field trips that students can participate in. Um, so there's a field trip to the cloud forest and Amazon rainforest. And there's also um, a four day boat tour uh, of the island. So like an island hopping tour. Um, and students in the past have been able to snorkel with marine wildlife like penguins and sea lions, um, climb volcanoes and even visit lava tunnels. Um, but it's not all um, just fun because there is um, a strong academic component to this as well. Um, at the Galapagos Academic Institute for Arts and Sciences. So all the area courses are taught in English, um, but there are Spanish language courses which vary depending on your level as well. Um, but even this is just uh, you know, scratching the surface because there are many different um, ways to study sustainability um, in different places all around the world. So some more examples of that include um, our direct enrollment program in Christchurch, New Zealand, um, where there was a week-long trip to Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. And there's our program in Quito, Ecuador itself, where we offer courses um, in environmental studies. In Cape Town, South Africa, um, the University of Cape Town, our direct enrollment program there, offers um, studies in oceanography, ecology, geography, and more. Um, Cape Town is a beautiful place if you like the city and culture, or if you like going up into the mountains and visiting the beach, all those things are accessible from that, um, from that wonderful city. And then we also have a program in Siena, Italy, a little hamlet in um, the Tuscan countryside. And our business and economics of Italian food and wine program allows students to focus on agriculture and the slow food movement. And as you see, as you'll hear from our ambassadors in just a moment, um, these are just some of the ideas because Really, sustainability um, is an issue, and um, th those, these are issues that you can encounter wherever you go. Um, so I'm excited to hand it over to Susan Hansen here to talk about our ambassadors and introduce them all to you. Thanks, Josh. Well, I am, so we all are so happy to have um, two former students with us today uh, to tell you about um, what they experienced while they were abroad. So we'll have them introduce themselves. Um, Miles, do you want to go first? Sure. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope everyone's staying safe and doing well. Uh, my name is Miles Nabert. I am a current senior at Bates College located in Lewiston, Maine. Uh, so that a double majoring in politics and Spanish while minoring in history. When I went to the IS abroad program, I went to Madrid, Spain during the fall of 2019. Thanks, Miles and May. Hi, everyone. My name is May. Um, Cody, I'm a senior at Luther College, which is in Decorah, Iowa, um, super small town. Um, I'm a math major and have minors in music and French. Um, my IES program was uh, in Rabat, Morocco uh, in the fall of 2019 as well. Thank you. Well, when we were putting this presentation together, we thought it would be really interesting, um, as you can see, from all corners of the world to look at sustainability. Um, so we've got some questions for May and for Miles. So first of all, um, how did you encounter or experience issues related to sustainability while you were abroad? Um, May, do you want to go first? <laughs> Sure, Susan. Oh, my goodness. How did I encounter? <laughs> so um, as uh, Josh was explaining, um, there's my program was not focused on sustainability whatsoever. Um, however, uh, as someone who values sustainability, it was really interesting to me to see how another culture approached approached it. Um, and so there are a few different things that come to mind uh, that made me think Kind of critically about how I see sustainability um, and how people in Morocco see sustainability. Um, and so just to name one example, um, 
as kind of a culture shock moment as well. But it's it's fun to think about. Um, in Morocco, uh, toilet paper is not necessarily uh, a common thing to find in public restrooms or even in people's homes. Um, there's it's a, usually like a, a bucket and a personal towel kind of situation. Um, and that was really, really surprising to my program mates and I who from coming from America, toilet paper is pretty much a given. And it was interesting because even at the university where I took a, one class, um, the, the bathrooms at the, at the university didn't have toilet paper. So, you know, I now carry a roll of toilet paper around with me at all times. Now it's interesting because that's not necessarily the first thing someone thinks of when they think of sustainability, but it is an example of something that in an American culture, we just consume that and we don't even think twice about it. Um, and the production of it and, and, the, and the distribution of, of something that we go through really quickly. I mean, when the pandemic started, toilet paper was a hot commodity that everyone was buying up. And in Morocco, that's like not even a thing that many families think about. So I think it was just for me, a really interesting thing where there's not necessarily like, oh, we're being sustainable, we're reducing consumption. Um, it's more just there's cultural practices that, that have some more sustainable impacts than, than what we're used to as Americans. And that was a really, really interesting thing to learn about. Yeah, that's what travel does, right? It makes you look at things in a whole different way, even things that we take for granted every day. Uh, so Miles, what about you? Yes, very similar to May. Uh, Madrid for me, uh, my program wasn't entirely uh, focused on the sustainability. Uh, from my hometown in New York, uh, Madrid's very similar to the, the cosmopolitan feel, uh, the tall buildings, the, the restaurants, the, the nightlife, um, a lot of people jam packed, taking the metro. So yeah, there wasn't a lot of, well, coming into the program, I thought there wasn't a lot of opportunities where I could experience um, areas focused on sustainability. And uh, until uh, uh, surprisingly one day I was walking with uh, uh, some of my, my, my good friends from, from abroad. Um, and then we were just coming from uh, a restaurant and just out, out of nowhere, we ran into a climate change protest. And to me, that really became one of the highlights for me while I was studying abroad um, in terms of um, how climate change and how sustainability is being interpreted by, by cultures other than the United States or different, different countries around the world. And to me, that was really a, a positive uh, experience and really surprising fact that um, here in Madrid, Spain, here in Europe, where uh, there are millions of people living in these very urbanized cities, um, people really care about climate change and uh, more specifically, uh, it, it, these these movements, uh, specifically this protest, was led by by youth, by by college or university students, um, also high school students as well. Um, that that led led the movement and who were um, in the streets cheering or or really getting excited, or really wanting to get people um, aware of how climate change has impacted Madrid and more importantly, how it has impacted Spain and, and Europe. So I was pleasantly surprised by that experience. And it showed how um, not just only in the United States where we're, we're trying to advocate for uh, climate change awareness for a more sustainable environments, uh, but also in Madrid, Spain, where um, there's a completely different culture. People interact with one another uh, differently than we, than we do here at times. Uh, but we still care about the planet and we still care about making this, uh, making our society and making our, our livelihoods uh, that much better. So that was a good surprise for me. Thank you. We've got another question for both of you. How are sustainability efforts different in Rabat or Madrid than they are in your hometown or, or where you go to school? Um, I'll throw that to Miles first. Thank you, Susan. So particularly, for example, um, here at Bates or in the United States, um, I'm pr pretty sure that May and uh, where, where she goes to college, uh, it, there's a similar dynamic. Uh, people 
uh, actually major in uh, environmentalism or uh, uh, climate change or climate science. And that's not really, that really wasn't a given in, in Madrid, I, uh, specifically where uh, the university that I, I took classes in, Universidad de, de Complutense Madrid, um, there was mostly a focus in mathematics or the, the, the human sciences, such as uh, politics or, or history. So students majoring or, or the, the interaction between uh, a student and uh, climate change or sustainability uh, was, uh, was a bit rare. And so I was, however, pleasantly surprised uh, whenever I, I ran into the climate change march or I, I for example, I talked to many people in, in restaurants or um, in, in daily conversation about the, about the importance of climate, good climate and sustainability. So I, once again, I, I, I was surprised by how uh, climate change is on the minds of uh, the people who lived in Madrid uh, so very often. So uh, once again, uh, the academia of climate change and climate science was uh, different than from here and in uh, Madrid. May, how about you and Rabat? What did you see? Oh, thank you, Susan. Yeah, so similarly to Miles, I noticed uh, in, in Morocco, there's not a, yeah, an academic focus on um, on sustainability. And in fact, um, I didn't even really see any Moroccans or hear of any Moroccans even expressing concern over the environment or climate change. Um, it's not really something that's, that's talked about. Um, however, um, kind of what I was saying with, with the toilet paper situation is that I saw a lot of things happening in Rabat and, and practices that people just live day to day that were, were had a more communal mindset, um, a less, less focused on consumption, um, that kind of reduce part of the reduce, reuse, recycle we love to, we love to talk about. Um, uh, I can think of a few different examples. Um, and one of them that cracks me up, I think the, so public transportation was, um, pre is pretty common in, in, especially in the cities. I mean, even in the United States, we have um, public transportation that's well used in, in urban environments. Um, in Morocco, there's a type of public transportation that um, I think is unique <laughs> that I have never seen in the US. They have this, it's called the petit taxi, so the little taxi system. And what's crazy about it is that it's very cheap and it's these little taxis and you get, like a normal taxi, you hail it and you tell them where you wanna go. However, in Morocco, you can also get other random strangers in your taxi at the same time going to a vaguely similar spot or not. So when you hail a taxi, taxi driver already has someone in it. They'll like point and you'll have to be like, yes, I'm going that direction. And then you can get in. So you don't even just, you don't even get your own taxi necessarily. Um, but what that does is it keeps more cars off the road. It keeps the traffic less bad in the city. Um, there's just a kind of communal thing where like I feel like in America it's very much like we like to have our own private spaces and our own you know things and then that ends up with with redundancy and and inefficient use of resources um, so so uh, yeah I think that there's like a lot of things that aren't explicitly like oh a sustainable effort um, but th it's a lifestyle and a cultural thing that that really is, it re focuses on reducing consumption and relying on other community members to, to um, work together to preserve their, their environment. Great examples. You better know which direction you're going, right, May? Yeah, it was very <laughs> stressful the first few times, and I <laughs> but I did get the hang of it. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, thanks, May and Miles, um, for, for your contributions. We're going to have a chance at the end um, of the presentation for um, any questions from our, um, our participants. So put them in the, the, the Q&A box if you have them. Um, and I'll hand it over to Robin. Yes, um, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Miles and May. I heard you talking about, I know, being mindful of the, con the consumption of resources and social organization for change, which both play a central role um, in advancing sustainability. So for any prospective students joining us today, you may be wondering about how you can find out more. 
first, we'd love for you to connect with an IES Abroad ambassador. Ambassadors just like May and Miles are students who have recently participated in an IES Abroad program who have self-identified as welcoming uh, the opportunity to talk with others about their experience. You can get in touch with an ambassador directly through the ambassadors link in the footer of our homepage. Next, check out student blogs uh, written by our student correspondents. Our blogs are um, written by students on site and contain personal accounts, videos, um, pictures, just really great field trip pictures in there. Um, They're searchable by program location, uh, by theme, and by university. Um, so find our blogs on our homepage at the tab uh, located in our header. And at IES Abroad, we're proud that our students are as diverse as the countries where they study abroad and intern. We have curated a library of resources on diversity, which address topics by location, by social identity, and there are also um, resources for parents uh, as well. Find our diversity resources on our homepage under the Study Abroad tab in the header. And finally, check us out on social media and subscribe to our channels for news and updates. So how do you get started? First, we want you to be sure to talk with your academic advisor as you begin to plan for study abroad so that you can understand how your credits from study abroad will fit into your overall academic plans and progress towards your degree and towards graduation. Next, talk to your homeschool study abroad office. Your study abroad contacts or study abroad advisors there will be able to help you understand what processes you'll need to follow for credit transfer, financial aid, and applying to your program. Then start your application at isabroad.org. There's never any fee to apply to an IS Abroad program. And from the point of your application, you'll be paired um, with your program advisor who will assist you uh, all the way through the point of application to your program departure. And of course, if you have questions after today, we welcome you to call or email us. We love to chat. It's our mission to help you study abroad. All right, um, we do have some questions that were submitted before our presentation. So our panel is waiting and willing uh, to answer the questions. And so uh, Josh, we're gonna start with you. Um, we had someone ask about language requirements. You talked about a range of programs. Does someone have to know Spanish or German or French uh, to study abroad with us? So that's a great question. It, it really does depend on the program. Um, some programs do require um, a language background, but some programs don't require um, any language at all. So Galapagos, um, you know, even though it is in a Spanish speaking country, you don't need to speak, um, you don't need to have any language background to, to go to the, on the Galapagos program. If you do, that's great. And you can further your language studies um, on that program, um, but it does just depend on the program. Some have that requirement and some don't. All right, Miles, next one is coming to you. Can you talk a little bit about where you lived when you studied in Madrid? And um, you know, would you choose that same thing again? Yeah, so essentially I, I stayed with students at a, uh, a residency or in dorm similar to where I am in college. Uh, so yeah, it, it's very similar to any stereotypical college dorm that you can think of. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed myself because particularly I was able to communicate with uh, not only students, but professors and staff who, who lived on site. And that helped me uh, improve my, my Spanish speaking skills uh, in a better way because I was constantly being able to, I was constantly challenging myself to uh, communicate with them. And I think that helped me develop uh, a sense of uh, comfort and sense of uh, calmness between uh, each day and each week as I, I, I progressed throughout the program. So I really enjoyed my, my experience and personally, I would uh, uh, do it again. I would, I would definitely stay in the, the college dorm uh, atmosphere, yeah. Great, May, where did you live? Can you talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, so I stayed with a host family. So I lived um, with a Moroccan family. They were just absolutely wonderful. I had a younger brother and a younger sister. Uh, they were 10 and five at the time. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really, I, I felt very lucky um, because I had a common language with my host family. Now in Morocco, there's lots of different languages that are spoken, um, French, Arabic, and then there's a, um, Arabic dialect that's actually the most commonly spoken language and so some host families only spoke Arabic, some spoke English, some spoke French. Um, so we kind of we got to to choose and we were assigned with host families based on what we what we wanted and so I was able to speak French with my host family and I got to learn a lot about them and see what what a Moroccan family was was like. Um, so that was a really I would also do the same thing again um, to to live with with um, Moroccans and really get a window into into what their life is like. I'm sure you learned some new words from the kids too. That's always fun. Um, Robin, coming at you, um, can you talk a little bit about scholarship opportunities for any of our programs and especially these related to sustainability? Um, yeah, great question. So we have a wealth of um, opportunities for scholarships and financial aid. Um, the scholarship information is located on our homepage under the scholarships tab. And once you click into there, you can sort scholarships by location, by topic of study. Specifically for Freiburg, um, we have a scholarship uh, for non-sustainability majors. So um, for example, if you're like Miles and you're studying pre-law, um, that might be applicable to you should you be interested in studying the topic of sustainability in Freiburg. And there's a ton more. Um, so please uh, head over to our homepage and click on the scholarships tab and you'll be able to search by what's relevant to your interests. Great. Well, I think that's bringing us up to time. Um, first of all, I want to thank so much, May and Miles. Um, as seniors, we wish you all the best and whatever's coming next for you. Thanks for sharing your time with us. Uh, Robin and Josh, always good to, to be with you. Uh, you'll see our contact information on the screen. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to contact us and we're very, very happy to help. So thanks for joining us. Have a good day. Bye.